Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching Lifting the Fog, clearing the misconceptions and misunderstandings and misrepresentations about Islam and what it teaches. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next little bit in this segment, I'd like for us to deal with the subject of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him. What is the role of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, in Islam? First of all, I'd like to mention that unlike other religions who have the progenitor as being the one that they worship, for instance, Buddhism worships Buddha, Christianity worshiping Christ, in Islam, the person who is the fo in focus, Muhammad here, is not worshipped, but rather the God of Muhammad is worshipped. This is a very important aspect of Islam to know about this. In Islam, the understanding is that anything in the creation is not the creator. And whatever is there that can be seen or heard or touched is something that can't be worshipped because it was created by the Creator. This means that there isn't anything that is acting as an intercessor for the Muslims. There's nothing that we can pray through to take our prayers to the Almighty. There's none that we turn to in repentance except the Almighty. And we don't make any sacrifices for other than Him. And at the same time, we don't have a devotion to a double God, a triple God, or something like this. It is only worship for the one true God, who is never like his creation and never in his creation. So Muslims do not worship Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although we constantly say about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means the peace and blessings be upon him. At the same time, understand that we're saying, God's peace be on him and God's blessings be upon him. If you understand that Muhammad is not God and he is not to be worshipped, then it's easier to understand that he's bringing a message from that God. Muhammad explains to us from the very beginning of his teaching that it is God that we have all of our worship for. The famous statement in Arabic that says, La ilaha Allah means that there is none that is a God or object of worship except the one true God, Allah. And all worship is due to Him alone. How could we make such a statement as this and then begin to try to worship Muhammad? Of course, at this stage, we would need to clarify what we mean by worship. If you meant by worship that one that you bow down to, that's pretty obvious when you put your head on the ground or you're you know, praying to something. But there are other things in worship as well. When we have a devotion for something that in, interrupts or interferes with our devotion to Allah, then that object or that thing becomes something of worship. Let me give you an example. We know in Islam that it's wrong for people to drink alcohol. They should not drink wine, beer, and these types of substances. Yet, if that became something so important to a person that they would disobey Allah for their love or their devotion to the alcohol, then you can see why this would be something really, really bad. Anything that makes a person forget about Allah and think about the creation to have devotion for the creation or obedience to the creation, then this is something not following the true teaching of Islam. And this, again, is not what Muhammad taught. To understand the meaning of correct worship is to understand what Muhammad, peace be upon him, was teaching. Let's do a little history on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and then we can better understand. When people come to us and say things like, why do you worship Muhammad? Or, how come you don't believe in the God of Abraham? You believe in uh, Muhammad as being the God or something like this. First thing we do is tell them, thank you for asking us about our religion. In our religion, it's imperative we always tell the truth. We can't lie. If we do, we can go to hell. 
Additionally, that we have the proof. Everything about Islam is preserved. And we can look real easily to the books and the texts that are there. The manuscripts are still in existence. The work of memorizing the Quran and the Hadith, the teachings of Muhammad, has been going on for 1400 years. This is not something that's left to chance, to your imagination, or to feelings or emotions that you might come up with. It's well documented. So we know that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a real human being. He was born and he died. Both of these things are important to understand. Additionally, Muhammad ate food and he had to sleep. These are attributes of a human being. In another segment, we talked about Jesus in Islam. Additionally, we mentioned that he also was born and he ate and he slept. These things are known about the creation, whereas the Creator doesn't have these types of characteristics. Now, Muhammad, peace be upon him, clarified the understanding of prophethood. So we know that he was a prophet. He claimed to be one, a messenger, a Rasul of Allah. Additionally, he taught us that all these prophets brought the same message, even Jesus. He did make a very good point, a clarification of the status of Jesus that perhaps even the Christians would enjoy knowing. That is, that as Jesus was born and then taken up by God, he's with God, he'll come back in the last days, and then, in the very end, he also will die. So this clarifies the understanding when it says in the Quran that about Jesus that he says, Peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I was raised up, and the day that I die. And they fall in that succession, which is logical. In this segment, clearing away this fog, removing the doubt that some people may have, we're talking about Muhammad specifically, peace be upon him, but also mentioning Jesus. Because these two are very important to us as Muslims. Some people might say, well, we don't understand why you have to talk about Jesus? Why don't you just talk about Muhammad? Well, understand this. We don't make up our religion. It's not up to us to decide what's in the Quran, nor is it up to us to decide who or how to worship. It's up to Allah, the Creator and the Sustainer. And this is what He has revealed. His last and final message, which comes to us via Muhammad, peace be upon him, is called the Quran. And this is how we know these things from Allah's Qur'an. I'd like to mention that we have other segments so that you can watch and learn more about all these different aspects. And we encourage you to do so, to check out this uh, whole series on lifting the fog. Because in this, you'll be able to also understand more about what Qur'an is, what it means, and how it comes to Muhammad. But specifically in this segment, I want to talk about what we believe about Muhammad and what he believed and what he taught. Muhammad, peace be upon him, believed in Allah. He believed in the Day of Judgment. And he believed in Jesus, peace be upon him, as being the Messiah. These things are important. He also believed in the angels. He believed that the angels were made from light. This means that you can't see them. You don't see light. You only see what it reflects off of. Also, he believed in the books of Allah. This means not only the Qur'an, but the books before. Now, there's no book going to come after the Qur'an. It is being preserved by Allah until the last day. The previous books before that, every one of them were from God, according to the teaching of Muhammad, peace be upon him. In the Qur'an, Allah speaks to us about the Torah. The Torah is the law that came with Moses. But Allah also speaks about the suhuf, Ibrahima wa Musa. Suhuf is coming from a word in Arabic that means scripture or manuscript. These scrolls or manuscripts also were from God originally. As it was dictated to them, those prophets, by the angel Gabriel, the same angel who came to Muhammad, they recorded these things and then taught their people. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, believed in this. He believed in those original teachings, in those scrolls, manuscripts, that are coming through the angel Gabriel and then to these prophets. 
he explained to us that just as Abraham and Moses and David and Suleiman had their revelations, so did Jesus. The revelations that came with David and Suleiman are referred to as Zabur. We call them the Psalms. The revelation that come with uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, we call it the Injil or the Gospel, the good news for the human beings. We understand real clear from this that Muhammad is not bringing a new message. He's not making up the Quran. It is not something that he came up with on his own. But it's a continuum of all of the scripture. Another thing that Muhammad, peace be upon him, believed in was the resurrection. And this is important to understand. The resurrection is something that he preached that human beings, although they die, will be all brought back. There's some good news in this. All human beings will be brought back. This means not just the Muslims, but in fact, all of the Christians and the Jews and the Hindus, the Buddhists. Check this out. Even the atheists will be brought back, resurrected again on the day of resurrection. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is there really is a hell. There really is a paradise. That's more good news. But the bad news here is that not everybody being resurrected is going to go to paradise. Just to be resurrected isn't the big object because obviously that's for Allah to recreate all of us again as he did in the first place. The big job here for us is to try to get to go to paradise. So when we talk about Muhammad, peace be upon him, believing in the akhir or the afterlife or the resurrection, Yamu Kiyama, which means to stand up again. And that's exactly what will happen. The people will be brought back. And all of this is being taught to us from Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet. Not as a god, not as a son of a god, but rather a messenger, confirming the message that came in the past and presenting the last and the final message in the last revelation for us to see. Now, I want to take a break and then I want to come back in the next segment and continue understanding the role of Muhammad in Islam. Sallallahu wa sallam. My name is Shrifa Tuni and this is brought to you from Huda TV. Um, in today's edition we'll be discussing about uh, the day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equated the samawat with darkness. The firmament with darkness and equated the earth with light. Why? Are there really pillars that cannot be seen? Or is it an unseen oh, pillar? Everything is running, but the relationships are fixed. Yes. So that it would appear to people as if nothing is running, you see. We are destroying the, our environment with our own hands. And that's why the Quran says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. Bismillah, welcome back. You're watching Lifting the Fog, the misconceptions and misunderstanding about Islam. We're in a segment talking about the role of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet in Islam. We're specifically dealing with the issue of what is his job and what do we believe about him. We've already discussed that we don't really see Muhammad as being a god or a son of a god or having a relationship with God that makes him a partner with God, but rather a servant of God. Now, he has a distinct name in Islam as being a Rasul, it's a title, and Abdihi, which means he is a servant of God. Abdullah means servant of Allah, and certainly Muhammad is this, and so are all of us, really, servants and slaves of Almighty God. Having said that, Muhammad as a prophet, peace be upon him, had certain things that he taught us that are essential to have the correct aqidah or belief in Islam. One of those is to believe in the oneness of God, that he's unique, he has no partners, he's never like his creation. Another thing he taught us is how to worship God. Not by worshiping something in the creation, but worshiping God directly. This was one of the most important points that he insisted on when he taught us about what is the right belief and what human beings need to do. 
in the Quran, which was revealed to him by the angel Gabriel from Almighty Allah, it clearly states, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنْ وَالْإِنْسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ some of our other programs, we've elaborated on this even more. But specifically here, we're talking about the translation more or less to be, God is telling us that I only created you guys for worship, to worship God alone, without any partners. This is what Muhammad taught. So as a prophet, as a messenger, as a servant of Allah, he was teaching us the correct belief and what to do about that belief. Following the correct belief in Allah, the next thing is to believe in the angels, which we mentioned in the earlier segment. To believe also in the books, all the previous revelations, and of course, the Quran itself. And following that correct belief in the books, we also know that he taught and would have us believe in the resurrection, which we've already mentioned. And then finally, and this is a very important part of the belief in Islam, is the belief in the predestination or the qadr of Allah. Predestination, fate. In other words, that Allah has full knowledge of everything that's going to happen, even before it happens. This is one of the subjects that we'll be talking about in more detail in our series, about lifting the fog. But specifically today, I want to focus on Muhammad and what he taught and who he was as a prophet. There are many books, by the way, Reams and volumes of pages have been written about the life of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. Specifically, what we want to do today is just help us to understand his role. And do we worship him? And of course, the answer is no, we don't. In fact, we worship the God of Muhammad. Just as it mentions in the Quran, talking about the prophethood of Jesus, saying that Jesus called his people to worship my God and your God, my Lord and your Lord. And in the same way, Muhammad is saying the same thing. Worship your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord, and nothing different than this. Let me explain what happened at one particular point in the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him. He didn't ask to become a prophet, by the way. In fact, he was rather surprised and, and amazed that Allah would choose him to carry this message. When it was evident to him that he needed to bring the message to his people, he stood in front of them and called them all together. And then he asked them, who am I to you? And they were saying that you're the truthful one. You know, we believe in you. Whatever you say, you don't lie. You're the spirit of truth. Then he said, if I told you that there was behind me, behind the hill here, an army of people coming, would you believe me? They said, absolutely. So he was showing them an analogy here. I, if I warned you about an imminent problem, if you have... Uh, army is going to attack you. Would you believe me? They said, absolutely. And then he said, then in this case, and watch now what he says. La ilaha illallah wa ana rasulihi. He said, there is no deity worthy to be worshipped except Allah, and I am his messenger to you. Now imagine these people should just say, well, okay, that makes sense. But instead they became very angry. Why? Because they understood the message that he brought, meaning something very profound. And by the way, the word Allah was a word well known to them. They knew the word Allah. He didn't just say to them that I am God and you have to worship me. He didn't just say to them that there is only one God and you have to worship him. What he said was there is nothing anywhere worthy to be worshipped as a God except Allah alone. That's the meaning of what he said. And that's why it was so profound. It meant that they had to give up any false worship. We today would understand that more profoundly if we realized that it meant we also couldn't worship ourselves. We can't worship our position, our status in society, or our race, or our nationality. All of these things where we boast ourselves up to be more than we are, to put something ahead of God, this is a, a, a way of worshipping that instead of God or along with God. This is better to understand when we talk about worship in the Arabic, it's better to understand it when we talk about this ibadah. But when we bring it to English and we start using these other words, that's when people begin to get a little confused, which is again why we wanted to have these segments, these in this series, dealing with these words and how we understand them. Muhammad as a Rasul, as a messenger, but not as a God. 
Muhammad as one who is a Nabi. That's another word in Arabic for a prophet. But again, not as a god. Not as someone to be worshipped, but rather one to direct you, to show you the proper way to worship. And by the way, he didn't force anybody to enter into Islam. He never did. In fact, that's a very important part about the correct belief in Islam. That there is no compulsion. That it has to be from the free will of the individual to select to do what God wants them to do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be real Islam. As we've discussed in other parts of this series, Islam means the choice of submitting, surrendering, in obedience and sincerity, and in peace to Almighty God. But the key focus word here is what? Choice. You have to make that choice. It has to be from you. Now, we talked a little bit about the things that Muhammad brought and taught. And one of those things, when we talked about the cutter, we're going to have a segment all for this particular subject, predestination and understanding how that works in Islam. We want to be sure that you take advantage of this whole series as much as you can to learn what the teachings of Islam are in the English language, in simple English terms. Very frequently, I see the problem of a person trying to explain Islam in a language that's not their native language. It becomes difficult for them. Especially when you're trying to translate from a... The Arabic language is very powerful, by the way. To translate from the Arabic to a language like English, which is, by the way, very weak when it comes to the subject of belief or in worship. There are a lot of words in Arabic for things that we don't really have in the English language. So... We can sum all of this up to say that a lot of the misconception that people have about Muhammad is because of the way that they look at how they worship. For instance, Buddhists or Christians who worship Buddha or Christ might consider that we're worshiping Muhammad. Well, this isn't the case. Those who worship God in everything, for instance, they said, well, God is in this and he's in you, he's in me and so and so. They might also consider that we worship Muhammad and we don't. He is not our Elah. He's not our Rub. He's not our Lord. But rather, He is the one who represents and brings the message about Almighty God. Once we clear away some of this fog and the mistranslations, misunderstanding, then it becomes easier to understand the true role of Muhammad, who he really was, what he taught, and what our responsibility is as followers of Muhammad. It is true, by the way, that we should always say, Peace be upon him, when we say his name. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's correct. But not because we're worshipping him, because we're praising Allah for having sent him. And we're asking for Allah's mercy and peace to be with him. Yes. Also, in our prayers, whenever we mention Muhammad in our prayers, it is to ask for Allah's mercy and blessing on him. But be, be sure you understand that we as Muslims do not turn to Muhammad when we have needs. We turn to the same God that he turned to. It is wrong, really, to call upon Muhammad because, first of all, he is dead. And second of all, even if he was alive, we wouldn't call on him. We would call on the God that he called upon. So when you hear people say, Ya Rasul, Ya Rasul, O Muhammad, O Muhammad, unless he was there and you were calling him for something, like saying, Oh, come on to eat, Ya Rasul, ta'am, come on, Muhammad, Messenger, come on and eat. Something like that. That would be understandable. But to call upon him in a supplication and ask Muhammad for something. For instance, oh, I want to get married. I want an education. Oh, uh, Muhammad, I need money or something like this. This is an act of shirk or associating a partner with Allah. This is where the people before us went astray in worshipping and asking from Jesus rather than asking from the same God that Jesus asked from. I keep comparing Jesus and Muhammad in this segment because I want to clarify for those who have been in the Christian religion, studied the Christian religion, and then done a comparison with Islam to fully understand that it's not correct in Islam to worship Jesus nor Muhammad. That whenever we have needs, we don't supplicate to them, but we supplicate to the God that they supplicated to. Muhammad prayed, and he asked many things from Allah. Likewise, Jesus prayed, and he asked many things from Allah. And you'll find this in the Bible, 
And you'll find this also in the Quran the same way. So when there are supplications, when there's asking, this has to be directly to Allah, not to anyone or anything that Allah created. A way to sum this up in a simple statement is to simply say, we do not worship Muhammad, but the God of Muhammad. Or, we do not worship the creation, we worship the Creator. Whatever Allah has created must not be worshipped. Whatever you can see, or hear, or smell, or taste, or touch, or imagine, all of these things are what? These are the creation and must not be worshipped. We cannot turn to these things for our needs. We can only turn to the Lord above, the Almighty. We'll have more segments like this, inshallah, God willing. So we hope you'll look for these clearing and lifting this fog of misunderstanding about Islam and what it teaches. This Yusuf Est is reminding you that if there is guidance, it'll only come from Allah. If you want guidance, ask Him. May Allah guide us all. Ameen. Oh.